Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to this brand new series that we're doing on the textual criticism of the Quran. Uh, I'm doing this series, as always, with my dear brother, uh, Jay Smith, because uh, we started it last year, another series that we called the, uh, the Quran's Many Problems. But this time, we are taking a different angle. We are basing our entire series on a book that I encourage all of you to get, and this is a sample of this book. It's called The 20 Examples of Correction in Early Quran Manuscripts by Dr. Daniel Brubaker. And in our introduction, we built a foundation as to why textual criticism of the Quran is extremely important. Today, we are going to give you more backgrounds about the book and the author. And with that, Jay, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Hey, it's great to be here again. Uh, listen, we did this a year ago where we, at that time, could only talk about it. We couldn't really show anything, could we? That's and it was kind of frustrating because uh, since 2014, I've been wanting to show this material. I've been wanting to get into it. In the last episode that we did, we did, we, uh, we kind of did a, a quick comparison uh, between the Kirat and the Continental text. We're going to get into that in future episodes. But let's hold up this book again. This is the book that we're going to be really zeroing in on. We've been looking at 20 changes. There's actually 21 of them. There's another one that he is adding that's not part of the original 20, and we're going to see show you why this extra one has been added in. But we'll get to that. Now let's let's talk a little bit about Dan. Who is Dan Brubaker? He got his doctorate in 2014, but before that. He, he has been interested, he's been doing this for years, going and photographing all of these variants as, a, as an academic exercise. Uh, variants on a, in the chronic manuscripts, early chronic in manuscripts. In the earliest chronic right. manuscripts. This is, and these include the Sana'a manuscript that you're working on, the Topkapi, which is in Sana'a in Yemen. This includes the Topkapi manuscript, which is in Istanbul. This includes the Samarkand manuscript, which is in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. The BNF. Uh, yeah, the, 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 certainly the, the Husseini manuscript that, that is in Cairo, uh, the Petropolitanus manuscript that we yes. talked to BNF. Right. But the, also, it's fascinating, he wanted to look at these major manuscripts. He went to St. Petersburg and got that manuscript that's in Russia, photographing them. And back in 2014, when he finally did his doctoral thesis and passed it with flying colors, he had only, he was hoping to find maybe about 15 manuscript variants. In fact, he told me he started thinking like seven or eight would be good. Because all you he... need is one. That's right. All you need is yeah. one to dispel this notion that the Quran is perfect, to dispel this notion that it is eternal, to dispel this notion that it is from the seventh century, and to dispel this notion that it is unchanged. That's the main thing. And I want to clarify, I mean, uh, you and I are apologists, and we're talking about it from an apologetic standpoint, but really, if you ask Dan, he's not really, uh, his mission is not to destroy anything. His mission is to study, you know, this phenomenon. Is it really, you know, a book that is complete, doesn't have any changes? And he took that angle, and he was hoping to find one, like you said, then seven, and all of a sudden, we have how much? Well, back in 2014, he had already found 800. Now, for let's just back up a minute. Dan is not somebody who goes to the streets and talks about it. That's right. But you and I are. Right. We do this, don't we? Uh, and that's why we're bringing it to the forefront. Because we're in a battle that's different than the academics. Now, you might say, okay, I've got a doctorate, therefore I'm an academic. That's true. That's not important, though, because we are polemicists. This is a word that most people don't know and don't understand. The polemics is going on uh, the opposite direction of apologetics. Apologetics is where you defend. We defend this book, and anybody that defends the Bible is an apologetic for Christianity. Anybody that defends the person of Jesus Christ is an apologist uh, for Christianity. I, uh, I'm interested in both apologetics, but I'm also interested in going the other direction, like a football team. You have your offense, you have your defense. Defense right. is apologetics. Offense would be polemics. That's right. That's in uh, religious circles, when we're talking about Islam and Christianity, a someone who defends the Quran as a Muslim would be an apologist of Islam. That would be apologetics. There's thousands of them that do that. But many Muslims, in fact, you and I have had experience of this. The vast majority of Muslims we engage with very, spend very little time doing apologetics. They hardly ever defend their Quran. They spend almost their entire time attacking, attacking the, the Bible. Bible. Exactly. That's called polemics. 
And Muslims are well known for this. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, God bless them. I get so enthused by them because there are the Muslims are so clear that everything about the Bible needs to be confronted. God bless them for doing that because they're showing us and giving us and giving us an enormous amount of material to defend. The and in doing so, they're bringing about the perfection of our book. I mean, Absolutely. They're showing yeah, how great our Bible exactly, is because exactly. they're asking the questions and we're answering them. And unlike what happened 100 years ago, about two, 1905, they, they, when this first became a, a, an entire study, a, a branch of study, source criticism, redacted criticism, uh, all your literary criticisms and what we known as the umbrella of a historical criticism was only geared towards the Bible. It was right. only ever asked of the Bible, no other book. For the first time now, we are able to take those same criticism and apply it to the Quran. But there are very few of us who are actually doing that. So what Jay is saying is we're entering into a new field that only a handful of people are even daring to venture into. Or put their face on a camera to do that. I'm not interested in the academics doing this because they have to keep their academic enterprise. Well, I have to be careful myself as someone who's doing a PhD research, as you know. So even I can relate to what you're saying because sometimes in the academic field, you feel like there is some limitations to how far you can go. Your supervisor will things. not say let you say certain things right. in public. And this is one of the this is rather unique to the Islamic world. I don't know of any other branch of study that's right. Al, where you are censored from what you're researching, you can't go public with what you're researching. Can you name me any area no, of research of any. in no. any field where you're not permitted to say what you're researching in a public context except for Islam? That is true. That is true. And what happens if you do take what you're researching and you go public with it? What happens to you as a person, as a scholar? There is all kind of things that can happen. We know of scholars that got threats. I know personally of people that uh, I heard about uh, in the past that were assassinated as a result of this. And therefore, uh, as a result of this, people tend to go into hiding or be secretive about what they do so that they're not exposed out there. I mean, uh, probably the most... Uh, probably the most... Uh, popular example is Salman Rushdie himself that is when true. he wrote that satanic verses that a simple true. book about yeah, two three 90. verses there in chapter 53 verse 19 and 20 of the Quran uh, that he applied to a novel and there was for 10 years he was under house arrest that is right. uh, under house protection not under arrest house Correct. protection Correct. because the Muslims tried to kill him for simply writing that book this is the only area of study I know of anywhere in the world where what you say will kill you so even as you're doing your research, you cannot come to conclusions with what you're researching. Even Daniel Brubaker dare not come to conclusions, but I can. Right. And my area of expertise is to do just that. I have to come to conclusions because everybody who is watching these series wants to know the conclusions of what we found. It's not just good enough putting it up there. We need to say, well, what does this mean? What does this say? That's what any researcher should be doing, and yet we get called hate preachers. I get called hate preachers. I get called an Islamophobe. Look what just happened a few months ago in November when I was in Hong Kong, and I tried to introduce this very material that we're introducing right now, this exact same material I tried to introduce at City University in uh, Kowloon, there in uh, Hong Kong, and the Muslims went to the authorities there in the school. The day before I was to do my lecture there, even though this is my part of my doctoral thesis, right. they said this man is a hate preacher. This is not something that should be introduced here in this study. This never been. They wouldn't even introduce this in America. They said, and the authorities there banned me from coming on university and doing my lecture. I had to go to a church a real next shame. door the very next day. That's twice now the Muslims have done that. This is the only area that I know where Muslims can pretty much ban you, get you banned from universities. And the right. irony about it. We would never do that as a Christian. And let me just uh, uh, mention something about this. When I talk to people about the superiority uh, uh, or the superior attitude of Islam and the superiority of Sharia law, people tell me, oh, we don't have Sharia law here. Do they have Sharia law in Hong Kong? They certainly don't. But who trumped you? Well, not who to trumped, go? not me. They didn't trump me because I still, I still did it. Well, what I'm saying, I mean, but who, who trumped forced, the authorities? Exactly. And why did they do so? Did they even ask me? Did they even say, can we look at your lecture notes? Can we see what is it that's hateful about this? They never asked me once. They never even came. So Sharia law still applies whether you like it or not. Okay, this is, this is through the back door. This is under yeah. the radar. Now, let yeah. me just go, yeah. and now we're coming back to what we're doing today.
If that is the problem that we're dealing with, can you then understand why we have to use YouTube, we have to use videos, we have to use the internet to get this material out to the rest of you? You need to know what the researchers are finding, what the Daniel Brubakers today. And that's one reason why we're really highlighting this book. We want to highlight because this is the first time that anybody has published this material so that you can look at it. I want you to buy this book. Go up on uh, Amazon and buy this book by Daniel Brubaker. We're going to help you unpack it. We're going to help you to show you what you're looking at, but then we're also going to show you what conclusions this means. What are the conclusions we can come to concerning what Daniel Brubaker has found? And so no. this is what's so exciting about what we're doing here is we're giving you cutting edge information as much as possible because believe it or not, we probably are the first to even introduce this book to you and are the first to even assess its content. So hopefully you'll find everything that we'll be sharing in this particular series, which is basically this book is the sole focus of this series. You'll find it helpful uh, for your own knowledge, for your own ministry. And if you're a Muslim, we want you to heed the information we're sharing with you. Go and even inspect it yourself. There is nothing secretive about it. So we're hoping that you will find out quickly that the book that you believe to be complete and perfect and eternal is nothing than more than just a book written by mere men. Not just one, men. So no one has written about the continental corrections. No one has yet really shown exactly what we're talking about. Altu Kulic and Ekmele Nisanoglu, these two Turkish scholars, they only referred to it. They just mentioned that there were these variants. They said that there were 2,270 in the Topkapa manuscript, but they didn't actually show where these variants were. Uh, right. They didn't really un uh, try to unpack it or even come to conclusions on it. We're going to do that now. Now, what Dan has done, he's just taken 20, really it's 21, 21 of these variants. And these are just samples only. This I mean, is a teaser. Exactly. This is nothing more than a teaser. His big work is yet to come. Because since 2014, where he only had 800, uh, roughly 800, he now has found over 4,000. I mean, did you, did you repeat the number to them, you know? We said he started hoping with one, maybe seven, eight, maybe 15, 800 by the time he finished his dissertation, and now we're talking in the We're thousands. up over, over 4,000, and more are coming to light all the time. And we're going to show why these are significant. But... Because of the fact that there's so much more yet to do, Dan Brubaker is going to come out with his big tome. This will be his masterpiece. This is what his legacy will be left behind. So this is nothing more than 20 simple ones to give you a cross-section of some of the things he is finding just to get the ball going. Later on, there's going to be coming out another program, which everybody can buy, called Quranic Gateway. And on that, you will be able to see That's many right. more of these manuscript variants. And in the Quranic Gateway software, it's an amazing software, by the way. I had the privilege to be part of at least uh, doing some testing on it. And we're not going to really reveal a whole lot of uh, you know, information about it. But basically, it allows you to just research the Quran and even see images of manuscripts related to uh, these uh, uh, you know, verses. And if there is any changes, corrections, erasures, insertions, you'll be able to see that as well. And it's documented, and you'll know which museum has it, and so on and so forth. Now, now, Dan is aware that this material is controversial and it's confrontational. He is aware of that. Uh, he, and for I the right reasons. You know. I don't think he is quite aware of just how dangerous this stuff is. Uh, he, that he is not interested in polemics. He's not interested in attacking anything that, or any that book. Is true. That he is, is true. a researcher. He is only looking at the material and then he is putting it out there. You and I are going to come to conclusions, or I should say I'm going to come to conclusions as we move through this. That's our job. As, as a polemicist, we need to say, what does that signify? signify? What and, does that now say about those two claims, actually the three claims uh, that we introduced in the last episode, uh, that is eternality, but more than that, was there a manuscript that existed in the uh, mid-7th century? So, Has it, uh, is it the same as the Quran that we have in our hands today? That's right. And are is are any of those earliest manuscripts complete and and here is where i also i am uh, uh equally uh, you know interested in this because i am somebody who grew up uh, born in saudi raised in saudi exposed to the quran and it's uh, studied it basically i went even went to an islamic university in mecca uh, uh, to do my studies uh, uh, in islamic studies uh, uh, department and i uh, have access to primary sources of islam i read the language of the quran i read the primary sources the commentaries and other things so 
Uh, I've always been brought up with this belief that it's a perfect book, has no changes whatsoever, has no corrections whatsoever. So this is to me is a, a, an important piece, masterpiece, because I want my people now to be aware of this so that they too can make that move towards Christ. We're not promoting a religion, we're promoting a relationship, a restored relationship with our Savior. And I'm hoping that I'm praying that this type of material will help you cross that bridge. Now, as we go through this, let's just be, remember, when what did Dan, where did Dan have to go? Well, he had to go to quite a few libraries. He had to go to quite a few museums. He had to get permission, personal permission to actually look at them. He is the first to actually go and get, create and find these. Well, he didn't find them. He knew the manuscripts were there, but they had to take them out of their glass cases and he photographed them. Uh, he was, it's important that you understand he went physically to every one of these places. That's why it's taken so many years for him right. to unpack it. We're, uh, since his doctoral thesis, we're talking about now, we're five years later, and he's now up to 4,000. He will continue to do this because people need to do this. Muslims have never done this. Muslims right. have never seen the need for doing this. Absolutely. So one of the things he did is he looked and he's saying, what we're looking at basically covers three areas of study. And I want us to really to wrap up this episode with that as a teaser and we will begin the next one with that. Let's go through these three areas, right. because, and then in the next one, we will go right into the exactly. concept. So one of the areas of study is paleography. Paleography is a study of the development of the script styles, with the, the different styles that are used. Uh, François de Roche is probably the best known for actually codifying these different styles of script. Uh, when, I, when we're talking about styles of script, you can see uh, that uh, some, some of the scripts that we, that we have have a slanted part. Some of them right. are what they call the kufic. Some of them are elongated letters. In every language, the styles of writing change over the centuries, and that's why you can date them by looking at the styles. We've already talked talked about one dating aspect, and that is the diacritical marks. When the dots were added in right. the eighth century, they then became, uh, uh, they were, we don't really know when they were exactly canonized. Some people say ninth century, some people say 10th century. When they, the Dhamma, the Kasra, and the Fatah, the vowelization was introduced, that's all part of what we call paleography. And then also we go into what we call codicology. Now, codicology is a study of the features of the page or book as it is used, including the writing materials used. Uh, and this looks at horizontal formats, lines on a page, the ink that is used, the illuminations, the illustrations, margins and bindings. Whenever you see that, the physical aspect of how the, the, the codex is put together, you can actually date it because different techniques were brought in, different technology was introduced, different types of ink that were used. Uh, uh, different ink pigments were used right. at different times. Illustrations are especially important because if you have illustrations, usually between surahs or use, sometimes in between 10 verses, you have medallions, you have decorations that are be between, that are introduced, that are decorations that are copied from a building. And we know when the building was constructed. So you can take that building's construction and you can date then when that manuscript had to be written. You know that manuscript could not have been written before that building was built. Correct. And that's how Correct. you can date it that way. But most most important is looking at the script itself. Then they have a one third area and that's what they call radiocarbon dating, which is probably the most inexact. And that's looking at when the parchment, now I'm using parchment and vellum uh, here because almost, in fact, every one of these manuscripts that we're talking about were written on animal skins. This is not papyrus. That's right. Unlike the Bible, we're not talking about papyrus, which are those interlocking leaves. We're talking about animal skins. Animal skins start to degrade once the animal is dead. And as the carbon starts to deteriorate, you can, you can actually count the number of years since the death of that animal. So the date most of the time is for the skin itself, not for the ink. No, you can't date the ink. Why, now, why right. can't you date the ink? Well, because it can cause uh, some damage, of course. Uh, if no, 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 that's not the reason. The reason you don't date ink is because ink is made from many different pigments. And that too. Yeah. You, yeah. Me yeah. you melange yeah. pigments that come from many different areas and many different times. And you can have hundreds of years between the different inks you're using. You keep them in bottles for hundreds of years and you put a little bit of this pigment, a little bit of that pigment. Little... There's no way that you could be able to know since once you mix it up as a liquid, you won't know the date on that. So that's why you have to date only yeah. the... The writing style the... sometimes, yeah. 
or the styles. You're right, but you yeah. date for as far as as carbon dating, it has yeah. to be the skin, yeah. and that's what people confuse. When you're looking at a skin, let me give you the example: the Birmingham folios that came out in 2015 at the Oxford Lab. They dated it uh, from six uh, from 568 to 645. Wait a minute, that's almost 100 years. They had to. Uh, because it covers almost a 100-year period. So not, this is not very exact science. And that's why the paleography and the codicology, the word area that Dan works with, are much more exact, much more important, mm-hmm. and as we're going to find, much more damaging. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, brother, for uh, giving our audience this uh, detailed explanation of just at least the introduction section of this book. Uh, In the next episode and the ones to come after that, we will begin to analyze in more depth many of these terminologies that we just used. And also we begin to have an exposure to these examples of corrections. As always, thank you, brother, uh, for a great job. And thank you for you, uh, uh, for everybody uh, for watching this particular series. Hopefully you'll find it enjoyable. And we encourage you as always to share it with others. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also hit the bell so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sira International. And together we can introduce Muslims to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you.